You know it's no pain, no gain Go hard till the end What's the use of playing a game If you ain't aiming to win My feet planted in the concrete Wings to the wind. I really want this to have value for you I love doing this um, Why? I, I've been an advisor to uh, companies for years And I learned so many valuable lessons as the CEO of Odesk for the last eight years that I would love to help people avoid some of the mistakes that I made along the way. So with that in mind, we can talk about anything. We can talk about funding, we can talk about product market fit, we can talk about you know uh, critical decisions and how do you make them. We can talk about culture or leadership or teams or anything having to do with startups or the fundraising process. Um, so maybe what I'll do is I'll start by just telling you a little bit about my background and how I ended up where I am today, and then I'm going to pause there and then open it up for questions. So if you have questions, start thinking about um, what would have value for the group, right? And uh, I'll, I'll consider this a valuable night for me if we leave and everybody here says, hey, that was a really good use of my time. I learned a lot. So let's try and make that our objective. So I've, um, I, uh, I grew up on the East Coast, went to University of Maryland. I uh, graduated, went into manufacturing. That was a bad choice. Manufacturing in the 80s was an industry that was going down and getting more competitive, more offshoring, uh, etc. And I was in a shrinking industry at, at a bad time. And meanwhile, I started to see technology going in the other direction. On the East Coast, I was reading about Oracle and IBM and these companies that were not really well known in the tri-state area, it was mostly banking. And I uh, and my wife decided that it would make sense to move out to the West Coast and try and get a job in an industry that was going like this. So we both launched uh, job searches within our networks of people we knew and a friend of mine from college, his wife was running sales at a little company called Pure Software and she took a shot on me. So she said, look, you have no experience in this industry, you have no experience doing this, but I'm, I'm gonna make a bet on you and don't let me down. And that company, Pure Software, happened to do uh, very, very well. We went public in the mid-90s. Uh, it was run by a gentleman by the name of Reed Hastings. Anybody know Reed Hastings? <laughs> now he runs a little business called Netflix. Well, Pure Software was Reed's first company. And uh, we just had a really successful uh, product. It was, um, one, I like to call it a puppy dog of a sale where, uh, you know, it's like if you go into the pet store and they hand you the puppy dog and you're not giving it back because you, you love it, that was our product. It was a, uh, a really valuable product for engineers. And I really lucked into a job if a, a, a boss said to me once, if you're going to go sell a product, you might as well pick a product that sells itself. This was one of those products. Was that called Purify? That was Purify, yeah. So I used it when I was a software engineer. Thank you very much, yeah. <laughs> I may have sold it to you. I sold a lot of that stuff. And it really wasn't that hard. Again, it was a great product. You just had to get it in front of people. Uh, memory leaks, right? Memory leak, memory leak yeah. detection, yeah. So runtime error, memory leak detection software. So. Um, that, that company was just a lot of fun, fast growing. You know, if you want to learn, go to a company that's growing very, very quickly because typically you have to solve problems at a higher rate of speed and you usually end up with more on your shoulders. Why? Because the company's growing very quickly and that was certainly the story there. We acquired companies, we merged with the company, we, we then, the entire company got acquired by another software company called Rational Software. And Rational was, was in a similar space also with some software developer tools and we decided to put those two companies together to have a more comprehensive suite of tools since you're calling on customers anyway why not have more tools in the bag and that company grew uh, very very successfully when rational acquired pure atria i was invited to be uh, an early employee at Reed's next company, but I didn't think DVDs in an envelope were a good idea. And uh, I stayed at Rational. It turned out to be an incredible uh, growth opportunity. Rational ultimately got acquired by IBM, at which point I stayed at IBM uh, for about two years and got a tremendous experience there working as employee number 131,000. So I started as employee 30 or so at Pure and rose all the way with a whole series of different opportunities and companies all the way up to employee 131,000 at IBM. And so why did I dece decide to leave IBM? I started looking back at my career and thinking about why did I stay every time the company merged or got acquired and why did some people leave? And it kind of boiled down to four things. Um, I think it boils down, and the order of these depend on the person, and it depends on where you are in your life. 
But I think it's about impact. Uh, people want to go somewhere where they have purpose, where they can make an impact for the business, whether it be in their role or the capacity or the responsibility, or better yet, if the company is making an impact for the world. And some people say, well, gee, I really don't care too much about that. Again, it's going to vary by person uh, and where you are in your career and where you are in life. But impact is, is big. The second is growth and development. People want to be on a steep learning curve. And if your learning curve, your growth trajectory flattens out, people tend to get bored. Some people say, I don't care. I want to be home every night at 5 o'clock. I want to be able to see my kids in the morning. I don't want to travel that much. And I don't care that much about growth and development. I care more about the balance of life, which is another one of the criteria. And then the fourth thing is financial reward. People want to get paid fairly and equitably. I think people also want to have some table stakes. They want to have some chips on the table, and they want to have ownership. If that company is successful, they'd like to share in the rewards of that. And when I started reflecting back at IBM, my impact was actually quite low. I was uh, on the integration team responsible for integrating um, 1,000 employees into a 130,000 person company, and that was good growth. And IBM had great leadership development back in Armonk. They send you to all kinds of classes and the like, and that was exciting. Um, so from an impact standpoint, I was employee one, 131K, and I couldn't steer the ship. I couldn't even get on the bridge of the ship, right? So I was just too far away from being able to actually make a difference at IBM, despite the fact I had a $250 million number responsibility. That's a huge responsibility, but it didn't matter if, if none of that 250 million came in because the software group number was 14 billion, right? So I was just chump change, right? And it didn't matter if I came to work at NADA. I like to say my, uh, my key metrics at that point were nine and five, right? As long as I was there at 9 a.m. and left at five, I was, I was doing my job. So that wasn't as exciting. And from a growth and development standpoint, my growth curve had flattened. I started looking at jobs that I could have in five years, and I didn't want those jobs today. So the growth and development had flatlined. The financial reward for a director at IBM is actually quite good. They pay you very, very well. They make it very difficult to walk away because it would be hard to replicate that salary somewhere else, but you have very few chips on the table, right? Your 100 options are not going to be worth that much if the stock goes from 100 to 119. Right? And so I didn't really have skin in the game. I didn't, I didn't have, it wasn't going to be game-changing wealth at IBM. And the fourth thing, the balance was actually too good. I was traveling a lot, but again, the, those nine and five metrics meant that I could be home a lot. And I, was, I had balance at the expense of growth and development and impact, and I decided to go and uh, back into the startup arena, back to where I had started in the early days of Pure, because I wanted that impact, I wanted that growth and responsibility, the growth and development. I wanted to have a broader responsibility and touch lots of things. I also wanted to be able to make more of an impact and learn a lot more. Uh, we started a little company called IntelliBank. I like to call this the character building phase of my <laughs> career. Um, uh, you said it earlier, Roger. You said, uh, I'll, I'll say it maybe more elegantly, experience is what you get when you don't get all the other things you want. And in IntelliBank, we got a lot of experience. But without that IntelliBank experience, I wouldn't have been a candidate for the ODES job, right? The fact that I had actually been at a company that tanked and I knew all the reasons why it had tanked made me more of a candidate for the next CEO job. So I'd like to say, if I was coming directly out of IBM straight into ODESC, they wouldn't have even considered me for the job. So the fact that I had left IBM, did 18 months at a failed startup, uh, and could talk about all the reasons why it failed and what mistakes I wouldn't make again, I think that made me a more viable candidate for ODESC, where I came in um, in 2006 and really took the company from the jungle onto the dirt road and ultimately onto the highway, where we, uh, where we merged with the number two player in the space, a company called Elance. And we did that because in marketplace businesses, uh, for those of you who don't know, Odesk is a marketplace. Uh, we took an area that hadn't been disrupted since the industrial age, work, and said there's gotta be a better way for companies to get work done. There's a massive talent war, talent's more expensive, uh, yet with technology and with the internet, we can shop online, 
almost better than you can on premise, right? Think about online shopping. You find the right good, you get delivery of the good, and you pay for the good. Why couldn't you do the same thing for work? Find the right worker, get delivery of the work, and pay for the work all via the internet. And if you could capture just a small percentage of the work market, that is a massive, massive market. And we're going to do that through a marketplace model. We're going to help companies to find and match with the right talent. We're going to help them to work with them as if they're in the same office. And then we're going to handle all of the payment. And the payment includes all of the statutory and the back office and compliance and 1099 or W-2 or whatever it is to keep the worker compliant, the company compliant, and us as a business protected. And we, um, we started with a handful of developers and a handful of clients, and we turned that into more than 10 million workers, more than 2 million clients in 160 plus countries with more than a billion dollars going through the platform uh, uh, in the last year alone. So that was an incredibly exciting uh, growth opportunity. It was a massive impact business, not only for the employees and for our investors, but also for the world of work, for every business that used us and got leverage out of online talent, and for every worker that now can work regardless of where uh, they're located. Um, it was an incredibly impactful business. And as I looked, uh, as I decided to leave Odesk after we put those two businesses together, and we decided that made sense because a lot of marketplaces do that. Grubhub and Seamless, HomeAway and VRBO, uh, Zillow and Trulia, uh, Odesk and Elance. You know, the, the marketplace dynamics are such that, um, you know, one-on-one -one can really equal three. There were tremendous synergies and the ability to really own that market. When you have two businesses going to the same place, and if they're getting there differently, that's one thing. But if they're getting there on the same road, it really makes sense to, uh, to put those companies together. Uh, we did, and as I started looking at my criteria, impact, growth and development, financial reward and balance, I decided to go into venture capital because from an impact standpoint, I felt like now I could impact many companies instead of just one. So instead of working with just one company where I was the CEO, why not work with multiple companies sharing some of the wisdom that I've gained over the last 15 years? And from a growth and development standpoint, I'm now honing new skills, skills I don't have, things I haven't done yet. I could go and operate and be a CEO at another company, and by no means do I know everything that there is to know about being a CEO, but I felt like the mechanics, I didn't want to wake up in 90 or 180 days and say, same mechanics, different business card. Same job, hiring, firing, making product decisions, uh, marketing, um, being the representative of the company, leading the company, all of the mechanics are the same, um, despite the fact there's an infinite amount of, uh, of stuff to learn in that job. So that's how I ended up in the, uh, in the venture capital world. Uh, I started in September after taking five months off. Um, first time I had taken five months off in 20 years. It was very uh, liberating. Uh, it took me about 90 days to shed all of the weight that's on your shoulders of being the CEO for eight years. It's incredibly, um, um, it's, it's amazing that you don't, I think a lot of you don't realize how much weight is actually on your shoulders until you're not doing it anymore. And it took me a full 90 days to sort of shed that weight. And, um, and now I've been thoroughly enjoying for the last um, three or four months uh, diving headfirst into Polaris Partners. Uh, Polaris is primarily an East Coast firm. Uh, it's been around almost 20 years, about $4 billion under management. Uh, Fund 7, which we just closed, is about $450 million. We invest in life sciences, which I don't touch, uh, and technology. And on the technology side, uh, typically SaaS-based businesses. Polaris has about 47 SaaS investments. Half of those on the West Coast, despite the fact that we don't really have a presence out here until now. And uh, I'll be responsible for sourcing deals, closing deals, and adding value for uh, the companies that we do close, acting as a coach and a mentor, and really making sure that we're arming and aiming our entrepreneurs to be successful. So that brings us up to, uh, to current day. And with that, I'll pause and say, what should we talk about? What's going to, uh, what should we? Uh... Good question. So uh, when Ordesk started, uh, Elance was already there, up and running, right? So you're getting into the same space. So how was the challenge? It's already going on the market. What was the uh, business model? What differentiated for you based to go into that space and then 
grow in the space and then was there any challenges uh, the gorilla was not letting you guys grow and then you're still able to grow? Yeah, so the, so the question is... So the, you, for the yeah. San Diego people. Yeah, so the question is, uh, you know, when we started Odesk, uh, circa um, 2005, what, um, there, there was already a player in the space, Elance, who started in 1999. And so how did we differentiate? What was our secret sauce? What made us different? Uh, and, um, yeah, and how were we able to grow? We ultimately were twice the size of Elance and growing twice as fast. So we passed them in 2008 and never looked back, right? So why? Well, primarily it was our business model. So remember earlier I said we're going to help companies to hire, manage, and pay talent. And there's a very different... Um, it's very different to actually hire somebody by the hour on the basis of time than it is to have somebody do a fixed price project. So Elance's business model was uh, charging for the match. We're going to charge workers that want to be in our system a monthly subscription fee. And with that monthly subscription fee, they're going to be able to apply to these projects. And a project was build me this widget, right? So I want this spec and build to this spec. And that's actually not a bad way to work, but it tends to be very small projects because those are the ones that you can write a spec for. The bigger the project, the more complexity in the spec. And a lot of projects on spec with a fixed price tend to be very, very small, $100, $200 projects. <coughs> so if you're getting a, a fixed fee for workers to bid on, on specs, and you're getting a small percentage of a $200 project, you have to do a lot of projects to make money. Where ODES business model was to work like the real world works, just like the offline world. Most of us get hired and fired based on our time, but we get, uh, we get hired and fired based on our work quality. We get paid for our time. So show up for work, and as long as you continue to deliver great work, you get a paycheck every two weeks. And that's kind of the way that ODES worked. You're going to hire me by the hour. As long as I deliver good work, you're going to pay me for that hour. And that tends to be longer term in nature, much stickier. And if you're getting a small percentage of every hour billed for six months, that's a better business model. So we came in with staffing via the web, not fixed price projects via the web. And that differentiated business model meant that we could give the match away for free. I'm going to match you with a Java programmer and not charge you a dime. And I'm going to give you value in the form of this management and payment platform. And the managed platform was, you can now watch me work for you. You got a screenshot of my desktop six times an hour at random intervals. That proved to you that an hour build was actually an hour worked. It didn't prove that the quality was good, just like the real world. Just because I'm sitting in the Procopio offices doesn't mean I'm doing good legal work, right? It requires somebody to look at the work and make sure it's good, and as long as it's good, they're going to continue to pay me. So Odesk replicated the way the offline world worked, and that turned out to be a bigger, uh, a bigger market and a better uh, business model. Now, with that said, we ultimately added fixed price. Elance added hourly. The company started looking more similar. And when we put the companies together, Elance had far and away a much better fixed price service. Fixed price, escrow, milestones. They learned how to do big projects. They learned how to facilitate disputes and the like. Odes did not because it was never core. And we knew time-based work because that's where we came from. So by putting them together, we got the best of both worlds. The best in fixed price and the best in time-based. Um, you were mentioning that one plus one equals three. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah, so um, Dee's question is, can you elaborate on one plus one equaling three? Well, right there, the synergies are amazing, right? Because they had a strength in the fixed price world. We had a strength in the hourly world. Uh, we had a very thin overlap of clients, less than 20% overlap of clients, which was amazing to everybody, right? So here you have these two businesses that are seemingly in the same space, you know, like Uber and Lyft. They're in the same space, but I guarantee there's people who have declared Lyft and there's people who have declared Uber and they're not using the same. So Uber should have bought Lyft a couple of years ago in my estimation. They could have avoided a lot of competitive headaches and hassles, right? Um, uh, there's, uh, there's tremendous m um, marketing synergies, right? Where you're competing for the same 
market that we're both going after, there was never an article where we led that they didn't follow or where they led and we didn't follow. So all of that effort and energy, there was just drafting behind. And so imagine you can put all of the wood behind that arrow. And it's not just marketing. It's product synergies. It's engineering synergies. You don't need two GCs. You don't need two corporate councils. You don't need two IPO processes. And you start looking at the cost of those things times two when really you could just do it do it once. Um, uh, we had a, a, a better enterprise business. Elance had a significantly better enterprise product that they were ready to go to market with but hadn't gotten to market yet. So when you started looking at all of these things, it really made sense. There were geographies that where they were strong. There were geographies where we were stronger. They had a better uh, worker presence in the U.S. We had a better worker presence internationally. So it was really one of these. It wasn't an if, it was a when. And I think we were smart enough to say, you know, the sooner we get this done, the easier it's going to be. And I think we can, uh, we can create a more um, a valuable business for our clients, both customers and freelancers, sooner rather than later. And that, in turn, will create a more valuable business for all the stakeholders and constituents. How much time do you spend uh, trying to find a culture for a company? And uh, to give an example, I noticed you mentioned four things, and one, the third one was balance of life. I found, I've been doing this, for, I wrote the entrepreneur column, right, so I talked to a lot of successful companies, I've been doing this a long time. The most successful companies, I won't mention them by name, uh, if someone has a balance of life, they won't hire you. And one of them says, if interest, if you put anything for interest, they won't hire you. Yet these were the most successful companies. One I will tell you, Intel for 40 years has had the 20-70-10 rule. Do you know what the 20-70? Uh, no, I'll just tell you the last 10. Last 10 percent, they fire you. They've done this for 40 years. I've never seen it in print, but that's under Andy Grove. The successful companies emulate that. So, how much time do you spend in culture, and what kind of culture do you want in your company? Well, um, you spend a tremendous amount of time on culture. As the CEO and as the leader, uh, you know, DC, one of the first things you said was it's all about the people, and I, it is all about the people. And you can't build a a, a great company without great people and you have to know what the word great means before you set out to hire them and so I think it's incumbent upon everybody to figure out what what is great mean and great for one company could mean you don't sleep at night that's what we want we only want people who work 24 7 and that they don't care about balance for life that's what great means to us and it would be a disaster for somebody who doesn't want to work 24-7 to go to that company because it's a mismatch. That is a divorce waiting to happen. So I think it's really, really important that leaders of companies define what it is that they're looking for. And my theory about building a great culture is it starts with the people. So what does that mean for me? Well, there's four things, and I would draw this picture, but let's visualize it, if you will. I draw a triangle. And at the top of the triangle, I, I say personal characteristics, right? Now right below that, directly center in the bottom of the triangle, I put motivation. And then on the right and left side, I put skills and knowledge, okay? So you have personal characteristics, motivation, skills, and knowledge. Now when people go to hire, what do you think they should look at first? What's the most important thing in that pyramid? Motivation. Motivation, okay. Why? You need to burn for the passion to do it. You need to come back. You have to have the passion to do it, okay. You can teach anybody as long as they have motivation. Though. You can teach as long as they have motivation, okay. Anybody else? I think personal characteristics. Why personal characteristics? Because that, I think, is going to dictate whether they can be motivated or not. Are they coachable? Mm, smart. Are they? Yeah, if you're not ethical. You've got passion. That's that's worse than that's a showstopper, right? So I I think both answers are good, and here's the good news: both of those personal characteristics and motivation, regardless of what order you put them in as a leader of your own company, are both more important than per, than skills and knowledge. Yet I met an entrepreneur yesterday who said he had hired the wrong VP of sales. He was looking for a new one, and I said, "What's the most important thing for you? Where did you go wrong?" He said, "You know where I went wrong? Domain expertise." I need somebody that knows the security space. The meeting was pretty much over for me, right? I think knowledge, you can teach somebody who is smart enough, 
who has high integrity, who is trustworthy, who is creative, who works hard, right? I had a boss once who said, you can teach a chicken to climb a tree, but you're better off getting a squirrel in the first place. <laughs> so if you want to build a great culture, go hire squirrels, but you have to know what a squirrel looks like for you. Your you, first thing you said was integrity. You're not gonna hire anybody with low integrity. You need to know how to find it, how to identify it, and make sure that if you're gonna build a company, everybody in that company has to have integrity, right? In order to, to work for you. Now, next strong second for me is motivation. I don't wanna hire somebody, A, that isn't motivatable, that's a personal characteristic, not a word, but a personal characteristic, and I only want people that can get excited about what it is that we're doing and how we're doing it. So in the interview process, it's a two-way street. I'm gonna say, look, I want you to get excited. If you're gonna drive from San Francisco to Redwood City every day, where Odess was located, I wanna know that you're gonna get out of bed in the morning. What are you looking for? What, is, what do you want out of a job and a career? You know, here's some criteria I look at. Impact, growth and development, financial reward and balance. Rank them for me. Tell me why this is most important for you. What, what is it about this job that's going to get you excited? And if they can't get excited or passionate about what it is that we're doing on a daily basis, or if they can't get excited about the compensation that we're offering at the expense of some of these other things, et cetera, et cetera, then that light is yellow on both sides and let's avoid a potential breakup down the road and get people who want to be part of our culture. Okay, so I feel strongly about personal characteristics, motivation, granted for certain roles. I'm not gonna hire you as a Java programmer if you're never coded. You're not gonna be our CFO if you're not a CPA. Uh, I'm sorry, you can't be our general counsel without a law degree. You know, there's certain table stakes uh, to get in the game, but, um, but mm -hmm. you cannot compromise on personal characteristics or motivation. Now once those are in place, what do you do for a great culture? Um, I think there's a series of things that you have to have. First and foremost, you need clarity. People need to know where the company is going and how you're gonna get there. First and foremost, if you as the CEO can't stand up and say, this is where we're going and this is how we're gonna get there, people are not gonna know where you're going and they're definitely not gonna know how to get there. And they'll make it up. They'll go to their own destination and they'll go their own way. And if you don't have people aligned on the same bus, it's really hard to get to your destination. When I came into Odesk, uh, the company had already started. Uh, there were two co-founders. They were really passionate about replicating the way that the offline world works in a marketplace model. There's somebody else at the company that was really excited about disrupting staffing uh, more in a local way. So they wanted to be more of a staffing firm. Uh, with some internet technology on the back, but a very much high-touch business. Think of it as a staffing firm, technology enabled. And when I came into the company, there were half the company going this way and half the company going that way. And the first week I was there, somebody took me to lunch and said, you think we should go this way? And then somebody else took me to lunch and said, you think we should go that way? And it was very clear to me that people weren't going in the same direction. And at the time, I really didn't know which way but I knew that we had to pick one, right? And so I would say on day 30 uh, of the job, it took me a full month to gather all the data and say, this is where this train is going. This is the way that we're gonna get there. And we're going in this priority order. And the very next day we had to exit four people off the bus because they weren't really on board with going in that direction. They, they were maliciously compliant, right? They were like, we don't, I don't think we should go that way. They were back chatter about we're going the wrong way. We're not, they weren't really excited about that. I did them a favor by helping them get off the bus. Clarity as to where you're going, clarity as to how you're going to get there, and then everybody needs to know what seat they're in on that bus. They need to know what they're responsible for and how they're going to be measured. Just that simple. Get the right people on the bus, tell everybody where the bus is going, tell everybody how you're going to go, Make sure everybody knows what they're responsible for and make sure everybody knows how they should measure their success in that seat. And that's my uh, culture 101, right? I think that's, that gets most people pointed in the right direction. Thank you. Um, Gary, in the marketplace, you have to achieve network effect actually to get the business going. Did you have to pick from time to time on which side to focus? I mean, just getting more freelancers or just getting more clients for the freelancer? Which one was like the the one that actually triggered the network effect. 
Yeah, so the question is with regards to building a marketplace, um, generally speaking, you need chickens and you need eggs. Yeah. Which one do you get first and how do you know? And then how do you keep chickens and eggs in balance as you build the marketplace? And you're absolutely right. That's what makes marketplace businesses very, very difficult. So typically, you're looking to disrupt a supply and demand where you have excess or limited capacity in one or the other, and you're trying to create a market in the middle. And we saw an opportunity to create a market around work. So there were companies that needed to get work done and traditional methods weren't working, so they were in pain. But lucky for us on the other side, there are also workers that needed to make money and to work and have the freedom and flexibility, but they didn't have access to jobs. Why? Because the jobs didn't exist where the workers lived. If you lived in Silicon Valley, you could roll out of bed and make 100 grand. If you're living in Omsk, Russia, not so much. And so what we did was we used technology to bridge the gap in that marketplace. We started with a couple of each. One client, two workers. Two more workers, one more client. Two more clients, five more workers. And we built the marketplace in unison, right? We didn't need thousands of workers. We just needed a few workers and a few clients. Well, lo and behold, clients told other clients. So we had some virality on the client side. And workers told other workers, as they're making money, they didn't view their friends as competitive, they viewed them as synergistic. And we had this phenomenon where clients were saying uh, to a guy in Russia, Evgeny, Evgeny, we love your work. And the fact that you're only $15 an hour is ridiculous, because we can't get anything done for $15 an hour in San Jose. Do you have any friends? We wish there were more people like you. Meanwhile, Evgeny's friends were saying, hey, you never leave your house and you're driving a new BMW, what are you doing, right? So Evgeny was bringing his friends, the client was happy, he was hiring Evgeny's friends. These guys love working together because they knew each other. Now they're all making money in Omsk, Russia, and other people in Omsk say, where are these guys getting this m money that's coming in from outside of our geography, right? And lo and behold, we started seeing this virality. Workers bringing workers, clients bringing clients, clients bringing workers. His clients had found workers on other marketplaces, but they loved our time tracking and billing. They loved the fact that they now could monitor and measure the work, and they had the guarantee that an hour build was an hour worked through our software, and that we could handle all of the payment. And similarly, workers were bringing clients. Why? Because they loved the guarantee payment. If you logged an hour in our system, we would pay you next week, whether we collected the money from the client or not. So we created value after the match in sending both sides to bring both sides. And we learned this lesson early on that uh, from Bob Cagle, who was a benchmark partner. Benchmark was an investor in Odesk. And Bob said the beauty of eBay was that a buyer could be a seller and a seller could be a buyer. And you buy something one day, you sell something the next and vice versa. So they had this cross virality. And he said, if you have to recruit for both sides in your marketplace, you're in trouble. So you, you want to be in a situation where if you bring one, the other side will come, right? In a marketplace uh, class um, that I get to participate in at Harvard Business School, they talk about a ladies' night at the bar. So why is it that women get free drinks uh, on ladies' night? To bring in the men. To bring in the men, because if all the women are at the bar, the men come, and the men will pay. The men will pay 20 bucks to get in. The women not only get in free, but they get free drinks, right? So that's marketplace dynamics. So for us, if we had the jobs, if we had jobs, we could get all the workers we wanted. So as we started building up to hundreds of thousands of jobs per month, we were adding about 5,000 workers a day, right? So uh, Uber, so Uber's a, a, a really nice uh, marketplace. They only advertise for drivers. They've never advertised for riders. So if they can get more, the, the drivers are telling each other, they get so much press, I mean, sorry, riders are telling each other, or just use Uber, oh, what is that? Oh, it's an app, you can get a, you get a ride. So that's spreading on its own. They don't have to advertise for riders, they have to advertise for drivers, right? They need more, uh, more drivers. So, um, so for us, we had that cross virality. Uh, we didn't really have to uh, spend any marketing dollars to bring workers, we just had to get clients. Okay. Is there a quick question in San Diego? 
Yeah, we talked a little bit about personnel and uh, marketplace dynamics. What other data elements do you look for in a company that make it worthy of um, investigation for investment? Uh, is it number of clients? Is it number of years in business? Is it a uh, combination of uh, market potential? What, what do you look for uh, when you start to analyze a business? Yes, yes, and yes. Uh, so all of those things are important. So um, uh, first and foremost, I think uh, you need to see, I, I need to see product market fit. So I like to see that, uh, forgive me if I offend anybody, but I've been using these words lately. I need to see that somebody is bleeding from the neck, right? So there's somebody who's in serious pain and it's explicit pain and um, explicit versus implicit. The difference between explicit and implicit is, explicit is I'm in pain and I want to do something about it. Implicit is I'm in pain and I can live with it. Uh, so uh, along the lines of vitamin or aspirin, I want to see that somebody's ready to take at least aspirin, maybe crack or candy or whatever you put above aspirin. So somebody has to be in pain and then there has to be a lot, that has to be a big mark, there has to be a lot of people in pain. It can't just be one person in pain uh, even if that one person is Cisco or Google or a very large client. There has to be a lot of people that are experiencing that same pain. So whether that's new innovative technology or you've got a better version of something that already exists, you need to see some product market fit. Uh, I also look for um, what I call some um, routes to market. So you've put some thinking into Maybe you've got a 3.0 product, the market need is massive, you've got a good differentiated solution, but now how are you cost effectively going to sell that? Because surprisingly, I see a lot of great products and technologies that I love, but I can't get my mind around how you could cost effectively sell it. How are you, or market it? How are you gonna get that thing into the, the market? And you know, my story here is that uh, having run sales teams of all, um, in all domains, telesales, channel sales, field sales, uh, international sales, every aspect of sales. At Odesk, we chose to have no sales force. And the reason we decided to do that is because we couldn't cost effectively figure out how to get these four and $5,000 projects sold cost effectively. A sales force would have, we would have been selling dollar bills for 90 cents. Right, and we couldn't figure out. I would have needed hundreds of salespeople to get to get those millions of clients, and so we decided to market the product instead. We said, you know what? No sales. We've got to figure out how to market, how to get in front of people that are interested and qualified at the time they are going to make a decision. So we need to get people that are bleeding from the neck. They know they're bleeding, and they're online looking for a band aid, and we show up with the band aid. But, okay, so going back to your first point about uh, product market fit. So you have a product, you seem to have a, a pretty interesting um, a way to address uh, the bleeding from the neck scenario. What kind of metrics or data do you look for to support uh, the effic efficacy of a uh, solution that, that meets those needs? How do you know it meets the needs? Well, if it's mostly PowerPoint, meaning um, you know, you've got a nice PowerPoint deck where you're talking about solving the need, then um, you're, you're not going to have many metrics. If it's Excel, meaning you have a handful of clients, I'd want to see, um, I'd want to see the data for those clients. So, um, you know, it's going to vary. That's what, that's what I was getting at. Yeah, so it's going to, it's going to vary by business, but it's going to be your CAC. What it cost, what did it cost you to acquire those customers? And then what is the LTV? What do you expect those customers to give you over time? So maybe your cost to acquire is quite high in the beginning, but you're gonna cross sell and upsell those customers later, uh, or they're gonna buy three more times in the next year from you at much higher prices after, after you get your toe in the door. Or you know, maybe it's the Dropbox strategy where you have no revenues, but look, you have millions and millions of users who are spreading your product virally. So you want to look for um, you want to look for your cost to acquire. You want to look at the lifetime value. You want to look at any kind of virality. Or is it a type of business where a friend is going to tell a friend, mm -hmm. or one person in the company is going to start using it, which is going to spread to other people in the company? 
right? Or, uh, or a vertical industry where that adoption it goes viral within that vertical. That's exactly right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but I, I like to get my head around the the sort of the go to market, right? And any kind of evidence, and I'm sure I'm missing things, but any kind of evidence that you can cost effectively scale. You don't necessarily have to have done it. I saw a product this morning that um, I'm pretty sure they're leaving a lot of money on the table because they, they're ready to step on the gas, they just haven't stepped on the gas. And I love opportunities like that. There was, one, there was another question. Uh, yeah. Another question in San Diego? Yeah, how do you recommend a startup that has traction, shown market uh, penetration or shown market uh, validity uh, zero VC connections. How do you break that barrier short of starting to cold call and cold email VCs? I mean, what, <laughs> not, what a, not a good strategy. <laughs> yeah, the cold email is really tough just because, you know, a, a warm or even a lukewarm or even a cold introduction is, is I think, better than cold calling. Um, so you got to tap your network. I mean, you've got to go to events like this. You've got to figure out who do you know that knows somebody. You know, you can really help yourself by having a great attorney, right? So, uh, uh, talking to somebody like Roger, no, seriously, I'm, I'm dead serious. I did not say Gary. <laughs> I, I well, can't even tell you the number of opportunities this is Chinese food. Um, that, um, that, that our, our attorney at another firm recommended, um, you know, me to. Uh, um, so, it's, it's, really, uh, it's really the network. You've got to figure out who do you know. Uh, that knows somebody and you know, I, I'd be happy to take a look right it may not be me at Polaris But if it's something that I think you've got product market fit and uh, could be interesting to somebody I'm very happy to introduce you to other people. That's good for me, right? If I make an introduction that turns into a deal I just help two people and I think in the long run that comes back to help me I don't need to get paid for that. I think that's something that I just enjoy doing. I love helping uh, helping people to uh, good karma. So you think, good so karma. you think it would be okay to share your email address with the people in San Diego? Yeah, I absolutely. know we have it there. Yeah. So it's a gs at polarisvc, for, uh, polaris VC. So polaris Yeah. Or just connect with me on LinkedIn too. LinkedIn that's a um, that's a good way to reach me. Is, is so Gary, we talked earlier about maybe just people putting down a one sentence as to what they um, what they're doing. You know, and uh, just compiling it, giving it to you if there's any interest. I mean, would that be useful to you? Sure. I mean, well, just, uh, you know, what do I look for? So I look for, I like marketplace businesses uh, where there's clearly a supply and demand imbalance and an interesting way of using technology to, uh, to solve that problem. But it's not necessarily the technology. It's the network size that's, that's important there, right? It's the size of network that, that wins. And so you need a a good strategy for acquiring, um, I like to call it faking the chicken, right? So you need chickens and eggs, you need a good way to fake the chicken because without it, it there, it's just really hard to, uh, to build that. I mean, I was at ODES for eight years and I still feel like we're just getting started, right? Like the company's just now getting started, doing a billion dollars a year in, in gross market value, but um, I, it's, it's the tip of the iceberg of what that business could and should be. Uh, and then also SaaS businesses, right? So anything that is, um, uh, you know, software as a service. I love businesses where there's some vi a SaaS business where there's some virality. It starts with one user, goes to multiple users. I like um, uh, obviously disruptive, uh, I, and I like uh, 3.0 products with a 3.0 route to market. Right? It's not the traditional, we're going to go and build an enterprise sales force. That just requires a ton of capital. Mm -hmm. um, and unless you're selling high end at high frequency, um, those are hard, hard businesses to build. And, and I love SaaS businesses with a data element, where the more data the business gets about the way the business runs, the more valuable that business becomes. Right. Mm -hmm. Uh, and there's obviously a lot of those. It's stickier too. Stickier. Yeah, so I used the e and also ODEX before. So one of them had a 20% overlap customer. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, uh, I feel like uh, the ODEX pricing model is much better than the e -lines. And then I find the fiber. Fiber basically means that uh, you can pay five dollars and then for other people to do some work for two hours, sometimes even three hours. Uh, very high quality work, yeah, for $5. Uh, 
um, the question is regarding the labor, the cost of the labor. So for, um, I know a lot of providers uh, if, uh, basically college kids or doing that part-time or maybe stay-at-home moms. But it seems like the cost of labor is actually getting lower and lower. So a lot of times when hard people do the work on fiber, I think the cost can a kid actually survive on $20 per day. This would be the gap on fiber. Yeah. So uh, can you share your view about the future? Yeah, so th the question is, um, so someone here in the audience has used, has used Odesk and Elance uh, to get work done. Uh, she feels that Odesk prices were better. She also said Odesk was so much better and what a great job I did. <laughs> if I heard it correctly, I think that's what I heard. She said none of that last time. And then she said she found a business called Fiverr, and it, it's uh, F-I-V-V-E-R, -F or yeah, Fiverr, and it's, uh, it's anything you can get done for five bucks, basically. That's how they started. It was very gimmicky, and what will you do for five dollars? So the businesses are very different. You know, Odesk is about hiring somebody by the hour, and yes, there's low wages, because a lot of these people are in another country where the average wage in the Philippines for a nurse, right, in the Philippines, is 50 cents an hour, okay? The average wage on Odesk in the Philippines is five dollars an hour. So that means that a worker in the Philippines can make 10 times the wage of a nurse who's highly educated, five years of college, et cetera. The problem is in the Philippines, there were a lot of nurses that we used to import into the US. We don't import into the US anymore. So you've got a dearth of nurses in the Philippines looking to work, highly educated, great English skills, incredibly motivated, great personal characteristics maybe without the skill and the knowledge, but very teachable. Odesk ourselves had 150 support agents in the Philippines who were phenomenal, right? So that business, you have to think about our businesses, how can people afford to work? Well, you have to think about their standard of living in that country, right? Um, one other quick story is that Bangladesh was the third largest country on Odesk from a supplier standpoint, from a worker standpoint. Great English skills, very skilled technical population, great personal characteristics, again, with a very high unemployment rate and a very low daily wage. So technical workers in Bangladesh, so much work going to Bangladesh that the Bangladeshi government passed a law that says dollars earned on Odesk and Elance are tax-free. Mm -hmm. Why? Because you're helping our GDP. You're bringing dollars into our country. Work is an export now. And so instead of you leaving our country to go work somewhere else, we get nothing out of that. We educated you, you grew up here, and now you leave and go make money for somebody else. We want you to stay here and bring dollars in, go work on Odesk, huh. right? Because now those dollars come into Bangladesh and get spent on cars and houses and restaurants and durable goods. That's GDP. So th there's a couple of examples of how on our platform you can work. Now let's go to Fiverr. Fiverr started with, what will you do for five bucks? I really like Fiverr. They innovated, they came out with a different business model. And their business model flips it on, on its head. If you go back to marketplace dynamics, what they did was they faked the chicken by getting college students and people to say what they would do for five bucks. So you're not exploiting workers at all. These are people saying, I'm willing to do this for five bucks. I'm willing to sing a birthday greeting. I'm willing to draw a business uh, a, a caricature for $5. I'm willing to design a logo for $5. And these are typically people who have figured out a really cost-effective way to scale that business. Or they're a student and they're an artist and they're happy to make five bucks because they could do it in a half an hour. That's 10 bucks an hour and now they have beer money. Or whatever it is, right? So they figured out a way to stock the shelves with product easily by having people opt into what they would do for five bucks. So most people don't feel like, oh, I'm exploiting this worker because it's sort of volunteered by the worker, right? It's a, it, it becomes more about the product, not about the person, right? I'll buy this caricature for five dollars, not, oh my gosh, I'm only paying this guy five dollars to draw this thing. It's probably going to take him three hours. That's a dollar fifty an hour. Ah, I'm ripping him off, right? Now, once they started there, now they go up from five bucks. And they say, I'm willing to do this, but that's gonna cost you 50 bucks, this is gonna cost 100 bucks. But they fake the chicken by coming at it from the perspective of the worker. It's a really innovative business model. They're growing very, very quickly. Um, it, they, it, it's not really competitive 
With Odesk, they're kind of different business models, but ultimately they could be competitive, right? It's an innovative way, another innovative way to get work done. In the same line, uh, what do you think about TaskRabbit and Thumbtack, and is that something that's going to come into this space, or is that something that's missed out on? So the question is, what do we think about um, Thumbtack, what do we think about TaskRabbit? Different businesses. TaskRabbit is on-premise local tasks, right? And I've been friends with TaskRabbit for years. I was actually envious of TaskRabbit, not that we didn't go into their business, but that they got so much press making them seem so much bigger than they actually were, right? Uh, they got press like they were this huge company. We were doing more in a day than they were doing in a month, right, uh, in, in total value. Um, TaskRabbit's a great business. It's about getting tasks done around your house. I need a gardener. I need uh, somebody to pick up a pile of stuff. I need my house cleaned. I need a bartender. I need a, a maid. I need a ride. You know, any kind of home service. Um, I think it's a really cool business. The problem is it's very episodic. You don't need it all the time. Disintermediation can be quite high. So if you find a good dog walker on TaskRabbit, what are the chances that you're going to go back to TaskRabbit? You're not. There's very little value after the match, um, which, I, which I think they're working on. And that could still be a really nice business, but it's a difficult one to build liquidity because the dog walker in San Francisco does you no good in LA, and I'd argue they do you no good in Palo Alto, because somebody's not going to drive from San Francisco to Palo Alto to walk your dog. So now you need dog walkers in San Francisco, Palo Alto, San Jose, LA, Santa Barbara, and you go build all of those markets and build liquidity in those markets in a very horizontal way, because you need a dog walker, a wallpaper hanger, a gardener, a, a, a hauler, so you've got to build liquidity horizontally, city by city, it's very expensive, right? And then once you have that liquidity, you've got to get customers. So imagine a customer in LA, hears about TaskRabbit, goes on, says, wow, this is awesome. I need somebody to haul my junk, and they go, and there's nobody there to haul junk. You're done, right? You just lost your chance to, to build that liquidity. So they're difficult businesses to build. I worry about the value after the match when it's local to local. We, by design, built an online business, right? So we're not, uh, you know, think about Amazon and eBay. I'm not about, well, Amazon, after a dozen years, now is local. They are putting warehouses in, in geographies. But ultimately, it was about shipping the good from somewhere else, not having the store where you could go pick it up, right? And that, that was our premise. Um, Thumbtack is different here again. They're matching you with a local service provider, more around home services, think more plumbing, uh, carpentry, uh, more like Angie's List, right? They're just uh, doing it in a better way. I've advised both companies, by the way. I'm an advisor to Thumbtack, and I've been friends and advising Leah for years. So let's go here and then here. So as the company grew for you, going back to your first question, um, I, and the culture changes, the requirement changes, the team dynamics changes, um, being at IBM, I've heard, uh, I've heard about IBM, that age matters, like, you know, age is a, IBM, people count by IBM years of experience, right? Uh, what was the challenge for you, to, did you, um, well, I'm also facing similar challenges of the end company growing up, growing rapidly, and then now I feel the lack of experience. Mm -hmm. Um, did you feel that and how did you navigate that? Yeah, absolutely. And if you're starting to feel it, it means you're already too late. And, uh, you know, probably the best story here is, if you think about Mark Zuckerberg and Facebook, he had a very competent COO. Uh, I forget the guy's name, but he was an ex-Amazon guy, really smart. You know, he was the one who got the funding, helped get the funding from Microsoft at $15 billion valuation. Owen Van Nata. That was the guy's name, Owen Van Nata, Amazon executive. Uh, I think he was the CEO of MySpace for a while. I mean, really solid guy, right? So why did Zuckerberg replace Owen Van Nata six months after he hired him with Sheryl Sandberg? Because Mark Zuckerberg was skating where the puck was going. You know what I mean? He knew that this is a great guy, but this is going to be a much larger business, and I'm going to have to have support on this guy's shoulders that's gonna be a lot heavier than he can handle maybe a year from now. 
So it was nothing, it wasn't that he wasn't doing a great job, he was doing a great job, it was more of where the puck was going. And if you think about the phases of your business, I talk about the jungle, the dirt road, and the highway, right? And what kind of people do you need in the jungle? You need strong people. You need people with a high pain threshold. You need people with a machete in each hand. You need people that are capable of doing multiple things, not one thing well. Uh, we had a guy at Odesk who was phenomenal. You could hand him a problem. He was a problem solver. He was like MacGyver. He would take, did everybody know this guy? Some yeah. TV yeah. character. Not MacGruber, MacGyver. He would take duct tape and, and he would fix stuff. And you'd say, hey, what about this SEO stuff? And he'd be like, I got it. I'll go get smart on SEO. And he could put together an SEO campaign and boom, it would go. Now, it wasn't scalable. If you put any kind of weight on that SEO campaign, it would crumble or the duct tape would break or, you know, it just, it wasn't, it was jungle tactics, but what a great guy, right? And what an incredible resource for the company. And he walked in one day and he said, I'm leaving. And my first inclination was to convince him to stay until I started thinking about it. And it was back to the motivation. It wasn't personal characteristics, it was the motivation. The company was now on the dirt road. And every time I tried to put him in the Jeep, which you need on a dirt road to go faster, he'd jump out with his two machetes and go back and hack in the jungle. And I needed people that could drive the Jeep and not cut people, right? And so he couldn't put the machetes down. So I kept finding things for him to do that were in the jungle, but the Jeep was leaving him behind, right? And so it was this, it, it's a metaphor for you have to know that you're transitioning and then you have to get the people who can get you merge onto the highway, right? So you don't just need people that can drive in the Jeep, you might need somebody that can drive in the BMW, right? So, but you don't want the guy in the BMW when you're still on the dirt road, right? So follow up, uh, one more example that I have is when, the rumor I've heard is when John Chambers came to Cisco and it was a, a hundred million dollar company and he was taking the billion dollars, he fired all the middle managers and said, reapply for that position because I want to know you're capable of dealing with a billion dollar run rate or, or things like that. But how do you transition and not leave the, do you have to uh, not, not be very destructive to that culture, right? Um, yeah, I think it's important to recognize that, um, you know, it's going to change, mm -hmm. um, and oftentimes it changes for the better. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's incumbent upon you as the leader. It's how do you lead through that change? Let's go back to what I said in the first place. What did I say in the first place about culture? What's lesson number one? You have to know how to get that and characteristics. Okay. characteristics the people it. first, right? right? It's the people first. So you're not, just because they're coming in with different experience or they've been at a company that has scaled or they have a different, they've seen the highway mm -hmm. or they've been on the dirt road, um, they still have great personal characteristics. And that doesn't mean that some of your existing team can operate on the highway, they can. Right? But you have to figure out which ones. And these are typically the people that you ne they never ask for a new job. You end up giving them more responsibility because they can handle it. And the more responsibility you give them, they keep rising to the, they rise to the occasion every time. They're typically in the top 10% of your organization, no matter what the job is. Um, you you want to create a path for the people that operate like that. Right? Um, and, and you also want to help people that don't operate like that or at the bottom 10% find a job somewhere else, right? And constantly refresh and replace with people that are not only better, but on our, uh, um, it's not necessarily where they're performing today, it's what's their trajectory, right? I, I have a question that would take a couple more and then <coughs> we wrap it up. But I know you have made your first investment, congratulations. I would be curious to know your thought process um, what made you write the check? You know, I mean, it's your first deal as a VC, so yeah. we would, would like to hear that story. Yeah, so part of my responsibility is to help um, some, there, some of the existing companies to be successful. So as an operator, uh, there's some pattern recognition I've seen, not only from IntelliBank, my last company, and IBM, uh, but also Odesk, that I can help companies to avoid some of the pitfalls, specifically in the sales and marketing area where um, I've executed in the past and happen to, to know that domain. So I like companies that have this product market fit, 
they've got a few sales, and there's evidence that they've nailed what I call the repeatable use case, right? It's not a use case of one where they say, look, we have Cisco as a customer. It's, look, we, um, we've got these 30 customers, and they all bought for the same reason, and they all bought the same way, and now we just need to reach more customers that look like this, and there happens to be a lot of them. And we have one sales guy, and he's got 50 opportunities pipeline, and there's another 120 lined up, we just can't get to them, right? So that's kind of the, the pattern of it's ready to step on the gas for sales because that repeatable use case, there's evidence that the repeatable use case is there. And the company that I invested in uh, is a little company called Accuvit.io, uh, and they've got a, a pretty cool product that I think um, addresses bleeding from the neck. It's a, uh, they're using voice recognition and natural language processing to, um, to uh, capture every sales call. So you make a sales call as a sales rep, more and more work is being done via the phone, whether it be in an office or on cellular. And um, that it transcribes those phone calls and automatically dumps the transcript into salesforce.com or into your database, okay? So think of it as it's data. Think of all of this data that's missing today because reps don't take comprehensive notes or they miss something or they're so worried about taking notes that they don't ask good questions on the call. So product number one is we're just gonna automate that and dump those notes into salesforce.com. We could have used that for this meeting tonight. Good. To take notes. <laughs> product two is what do you do with all that data? So let's think about, well, so what's in the data? Well. Why is um, one sales rep closing deals faster than another? Are there certain words that are being mentioned here that aren't being mentioned there? Uh, which competitors are coming up the most? Why is a competitor coming up in the Northeast but not the Southwest? What words are most associated with closing calls? Think about some of the data you can mine from all of this information that you didn't have before. Not only as a sales leader, but also as a marketer, as a product builder, et cetera. So product one is the automated transcription, product two is the data, and product three is what do you do with that data? So what are the recommendations? And start to think about real-time coaching. So uh, competitor, your competitor to HP, and HP comes up in a call, and imagine right on the sales rep screen pops up a little window that says, here's how we win against HP. <laughs> or, hey, you've been on the call for seven minutes and you haven't asked for the order yet. Don't forget to ask for the order. So product three is real-time coaching. So I think sales is about frequency and competency. And the problem is nowadays, frequency is hard. How do you know what, even what the frequency is? And how do you help sales reps to be more frequent or make more dials or reach more customers? And competency, how do you make sure that they're saying the right thing when they finally do reach a customer? And I think this company and this product addresses both, frequency and competency. I think it's one of those products, as I said earlier, find one that sells itself. Uh, in my diligence, I introduced them to three clients. All three clients wanted it. What's the name again? Uh, it's called Accuvit.io, right? It's innovative, it's disruptive, nobody's doing it. Sales is just one pillar. What about support? What about legal? What about other domains? Uh, I think they're smart to focus on sales because that's where the money is. Uh, and they're bleeding from the neck. Sales managers are struggling to hire good sales reps, figure out which ones are good ones, and help their bad ones to get better. Uh, with more frequency and more competency, this product addresses all of that. Uh, it, it had all of the components that I was looking for. A couple more questions and then we'll wrap up. Now, um, how viral is viral? Because these days, uh, everybody talking about nice to have a product to be viral, and it's literally overnight, or it's when three years later you're looking and saying, oh yeah, we were viral. But it's to, because you just mentioned it took you eight years to bring Odesk where you where it's, it is right now, and it just started. Yeah, yeah, and we were doubling every year, right? It just takes that long <laughs> to get to a billion dollars. Um, how viral is viral? Uh, I think it depends. Depends on the product. Is it consumer? It depends on how big the market is. It depends on what the price point is. But one way to look at it is how. You have to look at how you're acquiring customers. It goes back to my routes to market, right? And if you, let's take Odesk as an example. So if we looked at, um, we had a chart that I would call user lead source. So a user, where did a user come from? What was the lead that bought them to a user, right? 
And if we looked at that, and we looked at the trending on each of those sources. So at the bottom we had PR. And so PR would bring users, and it was a little bit up and to the right, PR was good for us. It was cost effective, right? So if we acquired users via PR, we could see that trend going up and to the right. And by the way, users was only clients, it wasn't workers, right? So this was just jobs which were our limiting reagent. Second line was SEO. Uh, the third line was blogs and forums. The fourth line was uh, traditional, trade show, whatever, market awareness, uh, et cetera. The fifth line was SEM, paid search. The sixth line was word of mouth, okay? And if you looked at word of mouth, it was 52% of our traffic, and it was the steepest and up and to the right. So I would look at that and say, you know, the difference between SEM and, uh, and word of mouth is word of mouth is free. SEM you have to pay for it. So the more word of mouth we got, the more customers that told other customers, the more SEM we could afford to do, right? As long as they paid at the same ratio. So what would it take to get more word of mouth? And we had a head of marketing that would say, you want more customers? Let's make the product better. Take my marketing budget and give it to product to make the experience for a client better. Give them a reason to tell a friend. Mm -hmm. And that's how we should market. So we had a very, very smart marketer who would advocate for delivering a better service as the best way to market. So that was core to our, uh, our thesis of customer acquisition. So we said, first let's give people a reason to tell a friend, and then let's give them a way to tell a friend. And that's the best marketing tool we had. So every customer will bring some percentage of another customer. It doesn't have to be one, two, or three. It could be every customer brings a half of another customer. That could be viral enough, right? If you pay to acquire one and they bring a half of another organically, that can be good enough depending on, on your product. For Odesk, it certainly was. I remember a story you told us about uh, Dave McClure's uh, marketing um, campaign. Can yeah. you tell us about it? Yeah, so Dave, does everybody know Dave McClure, 500 Startups? He's a very well-known guy, very prolific. Uh, loves the F-bomb, he's a, he's a really great guy. Few people know that he was the acting VP of marketing at Odess in 2006. So Dave was at Simply Hired, I got introduced to him through uh, uh, one of our VCs, and I said, Dave, why don't you come work with us at Odess? He said, okay, so he was three days a week with us. And he wanted the VP of marketing job. I said, no, you're not, your motivation isn't, isn't right for what we want. Our traffic under Dave was through the roof, that guy, was so good at buzz, right, at marketing. I'm, we're on Good Morning America, I'm on stage at TechCrunch Disrupt. I mean, that guy could get into any party. We had phenomenal ads. I mean, he was really, really great, but they didn't necessarily turn into clients. When Dave left, our buzz meter, you know, our, our, our hits went down, but our conversions went up, right? So don't confuse motion or activity with progress. Right? You have to make sure that, you're, that it's good traffic, that it's converting. You, know, you don't care about the denominator, you care about the numerator. Right? And you don't want to just beef this up to have all of your conversion go down. You need to think about your funnel all the way through, all the way through to lifetime value. Um, but as long as you can get virality with good uh, paying customers, um, give people a reason to tell a friend and then a way to tell a friend. If you do that well, you'll have virality. I have a question on uh, fundraising. Um, so, how do you uh, did how do you uh, take that into aspect at ODES and in the current um, market where there's a lot of open source projects, open source products. So, for an entrepreneur who is trying to get the product out of the door, uh, what kind of advice do you give for the entrepreneur to raise fund and when is a good time to do fundraising? Yeah, so let's talk about Odesk. And to, to cue up that conversation, let's talk about IntelliBank. So my last company, I didn't talk much about. My character building experience was called IntelliBank. And we had a really great idea. I think it was a great idea. It was a web dev interface on your desktop. So picture a folder that lives on your desktop where you could drag and drop documents right from your desktop into that folder and automatically share them with friends. Sounds pretty cool, right? Sounds like... Dropbox. Dropbox. A company called Dropbox. We were Dropbox in 2005, right? We had a really slick product, and I would argue it was even better than Dropbox. We had check-in and check-out. 
So I could see that a document was being used by you, so I couldn't overwrite it. We had version control. So if you made changes, I could see what changes you made or roll back to the previous version. I had workflow. So I could say, when I get done editing a document, I want it to go over here, and then they have to sign off, and then it has to go here. We had security down to the object layer. We have all of these features and functionality that companies like Dropbox don't have today, as far as I know. They may have it now. So the beauty of it was that we had this phenomenally rich feature set that looked like Microsoft SharePoint. So we're trying to sell this beautiful web dev interface, drag and drop, share with whoever you want, and it looked more like SharePoint. Lo and behold, we were trying to sell it to bigger clients, and we were trying to solve too broad of a problem. I was solving workflow for one client, check in and check out for another, security to the object layer for another, and it was, it was a 3.0 product with a 1.0 sales problem. And we couldn't raise money because people looked at it and said, yeah, you have 60 customers, but look what it costs again. You're competing against SharePoint. Who wants this? Right? So we went after the wrong market with the wrong route to market. We pitched 30 VCs up and down Sand Hill Road, New York, everywhere and um, were unsuccessful at getting what would be considered an A round today. We had significant seed money, but we were a tweener. We, 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 had, we needed money as if we were a B, but we weren't where we needed to be for an A. So we were past one, but not quite to the other. And today, we'd get funding easily. I think we had a, a, a slick product, except now there's too much competition. We went about it the entirely wrong way. Nowadays, I think it's easy to get some seed capital, prove product market fit, take it from PowerPoint to Excel, show some early traction, and then raise a nice healthy egg, right? And so my guidance is, so when should you be fun? Oh, Odesk was very, very different. Odesk was, um, you know, we, uh, we raised an A round, uh, it was $6 million, and basically companies came to us preemptively and said, we love what you're doing, we love marketplaces, we think there's a lot of disruption here. We raised eight million in a B. Uh, it was almost like somebody coming and saying, I'll take your house before you put it on the market, right? We didn't, don't have to fix it up, don't paint the fence, we'll take it as is, no contingencies, fair valuation. That was eight million dollars on a 24 pre. So, uh, you know, nice healthy valuation, great deal for the investor. Uh, 10 months later, we raised uh, 15 million on a 115 pre, a 110 pre. So, it, and that was also preemptive, right? That was somebody coming to us saying we want in. So I, if I come across as cocky, I don't mean to be. Um, I just want you to bear in mind that I had the experience of pitching 30 times for IntelliBank. We couldn't articulate a good strategy. We clearly did not have product market fit. We had 60 clients of 40 different flavors. We didn't know cost effectively how to reach. We had no virality. The sales were decent, but the adoption or usage was not. We had a product that you could sell, but it was hard to get people to use it. You gotta watch for that trap. So many mistakes. When should you be fundraising? Always. You should always be having coffee and selling your company and your ideas. And I like to say having coffee because everything is always for sale. I was having coffee with investors when we weren't raising money, and lo and behold, they gave us money. So uh, fundraising can be a massive distraction. You don't wanna be on the road, you also don't want to be the house that's been on the market for 365 days with no offers. So you've got to be really uh, targeted and uh, and focused on on how you uh, on how you do it. Okay, one Very, more question, and then okay. from investment point of view, if you have two companies, one have uh, the age group is the user use of the age group is like uh, 15 to 25. And for each of the user, uh, the value you can get from the user is about the three cents. But uh, the company actually has 100 million users. That's one company. And the company B might be having like a 10 million, 10 million users. But for each of the users, they can realize about $10 per user. So which one is more valuable for the investor? Um, so she's asking a question about um, one company has uh, more users at a lower price point, another has less users. Oh, the uh, eight is below 25 and then 10 cents. Yeah. That's like uh, saying which way would you go with not all the information. So I think it, it would depend. Uh, for me personally, it would depend on what's the market, how big is the market, who are the competitors, who's the team. 
Uh, what's the growth rate? You have 10 million users, but the growth is slowed. Uh, it, I, I would look at what's the strategy? Where does the company go next, right? A Zynga could have been one of those companies, but they were built on top of somebody else, Facebook, and they didn't have a strategy to go to the next uh, place. It could be demand media that was built on top of Google. So I don't want to get into which company. I'm not going to give you an answer A or B. I'm going to say I don't have enough information. Yeah, so Gary, just a little bit about you know Polaris and you know um, Stage, your Series A, uh, your average size deal is at three to five. Uh, maybe you could just give people a little bit of information about that, sure. so that you know they you know, we, we we get targeted. Uh, that's the first part of the question. The second part, you know, I've got clients here also in San Diego, they may have traction, don't have a team yet. Hmm. Um, you know, when someone comes to you with you know having demonstrated market fit. Um, but they don't have a team, will you help them build a team? Or do you want to see you know, a team in place, at least in terms of the core? Uh, um, team in place. I, you know, a team could be two people, right? Yeah. It could be two co-founders that recognize they don't have all the capability they need. It doesn't have to be a fully baked team. As a matter of fact, a lot of the companies I look at, uh, I saw a company today, and a um, gentleman had hired his sales leader about six months ago. He's got the wrong sales guy. It's very clear to me. He thinks he has the right guy. Uh, he's got the right marketer. He's got the right uh, the right product in engineering, but he doesn't have the right uh, the right sales leader. So, uh, doesn't necessarily have to have all the right pieces in place, uh, but has to know what skills and capabilities they have, and what capabilities they don't have. Um, That's great. And recognize that they do in fact need to round that team out. And I love helping. One of the things that I love doing is putting good people in great companies and watching them be successful. Uh, what does Polaris look for? So we're, um, our last fund was $450 million. Uh, think about half of that going to tech. We typically look at A and B rounds, although we have done some C. We led the round in a company called Inside Sales. That was a C round investment. Um, uh, we've done some other uh, uh, C round investments, but we typically look for A and B. And you lead. And we lead. Do you syndicate as well? Or? We do, yeah. So uh, many times um, we syndicated inside sales with Kleiner Perkins right? and uh, pro rata from existing. So we, um, uh, but we like to lead. Uh, we'll also participate, um, uh, uh, typically A and B. Uh, with that said, we've done some early stage investments as well. Uh, but uh, typically A and B, we have about 47 SaaS investments, about half of those in the Bay Area. Um, uh, you know, companies like WordPress and Log Me In and Legal Zoom and Kissmetrics, Inside Sales, Kissmetrics. Yeah. Right. But no seed. Uh, you guys don't do any seed funding. Uh, I, I don't want to say any, but very, very little. It would have to be a uh, a, a rare instance of you know, um, you know, a scrappy entrepreneur, a million dollar convertible note, and a light traction. Okay, and just to wrap it up, I know there's a question in San Diego, and then that will be the last one. Yeah, I had a question. I, um, yeah, going back to the team uh, discussion, uh, just funny because thank, thank you to you and to Odesk. Now, like uh, I see many companies like mine, like startups, okay, it's team of one, and the rest of the team is spread around the world. So you have like working with Odesk, you have all the people working with you, because they are everywhere. How can you, you know, how can you, how can be, how credible you can be at that point, when you go there and you say, I'm team of one, the rest of my people, they are working around the world. They're part of me from my year to years, but one is in Bangladesh, one is in the Philippines, one is in Europe. Well, um, I think you'd be very credible. Um, you know, depending on what you're doing, right? I, I know a handful of investors where if you're not using Odesk, they'll view it as a negative, right? So I, for me and for us, right, as a company, we had 160 employees. We had two times that number in full-time equivalent online workers. So we ourselves built our business. We were, we were two to one Odesk contractors to employees. <laughs> So it's all about leverage and best in the highest use. And I think what some investors want to see is that you're, uh, you know, they want to see scrappiness. They want to see that you've, 
you know, you're willing to do whatever it takes to get this thing built and to do it in a smart way, right? Some, some investors may look at that and say, that's savvy. Now, they also want to see that it's, um, that it's built to last, right? That there is some infrastructure and that, that you can pile something out. If you say, look, my marketer is on Odesk and my sales guy is on Odesk and all of my engineers, maybe not so much, right? So for us, it was uh, two to one. So think about that. That means that 30% of our workforce was permanent on-premise, not even on-premise, but permanent employees, and two-thirds was, uh, was uh, you know, online, on-demand uh, contract workers. Did you pay commission on that, the desk? Uh, we did not pay commission on that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, why don't we give a <laughs>